How many of you can pinpoint a moment, a defining moment, where something happened that radically changed your life? For some of you, this message is that moment. As Christians, we've always been told that our faith starts in the New Testament, and so our entire lives have been fashioned from that idea. But what if new evidence has come forth that shows how a major prophetic event in the Old Testament reveals the real roots of our faith? And the revelation of this event changes everything. Originally, the Kingdom of Israel was 12 tribes and one kingdom. But under King Solomon, because of Israel's disobedience to God's law, they were split into two kingdoms. The house of Israel in the north with ten tribes, and the house of Judah in the south with two tribes. Then in 586 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah goes into captivity into Babylon for 70 years. They come back and resettle Jerusalem, which is the only reason why the Jewish people exist today, because their ancestors came back. The northern kingdom continually broke the law of God, and they too were taken into captivity into Assyria. From here, just as the Bible foretold, they assimilated into the nations, would lose their identity as the northern house of Israel, they would be pushed into all four corners of the then known world, which would eventually be the four corners of the earth today. The Asherites, the Reubenites, the Danites, all the other tribes, where are they? They don't exist today because they never came back. God said that at the end of time, the lost tribes would be found amongst the Gentiles and their identity would be revealed. This is the mystery that Paul talks about that is finally being discovered in these last days and is by far the most important prophecy that has ever been told. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no house of Gentiles in this passage or anywhere in the Bible for that matter. And since there is no slave or free and no Jew or Gentile in Christ, and it's not about bloodline anyway, then how do the Gentiles fit into the new covenant? All of the analogies of the New Testament, the bride, the grafting into the olive tree in Romans 11, the one new man of Ephesians 2, if we do not understand the greatest prophecy and mystery that brought us the New Testament, three quarters of the Bible will be completely shut to our understanding. For generations and generations and generations, millions and millions of people that have been scattered to the four corners of the earth, the northern house of Israel has never come back. With your permission, I would like to pray and ask the Father to bless and anoint this and let Him do what He does best. Amen? Amen. All right. So, Father, come before You on behalf of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of the descendants, God, that came from their loins that You gave them in promise and in covenant. And Yahweh, I just ask that You would move upon Your Word tonight like never before. Father, as this message goes out, on the tour portion week, God, where Jacob wrestles with an angel and his name is changed, Lord, and his identity and mission and purpose forever become anew. That I pray that your people will begin to struggle with you as well and come to the place, O oh God, where they meet their destiny 2,000 years removed from them. Lord, I thank you for your word and I thank you that you allow us to mine your word for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And lastly, God, I pray that the truth will only do one thing, and that's set your people free. Amen. All right, let's begin. 
Do you ever feel like this? Do you ever feel like when you're hearing God, you hear His voice, and you have every, you, you can't figure out exactly which direction that He's coming from? Is it left? Is it right? You pull up to the stop sign, and the sign tell you you can't make any direction. Matter of fact, you can't even turn around. A lot of people feel like this in their spiritual walk. This is where we are today. People don't know which direction to turn. Or maybe you feel like this, where you can't even read the signs. It's so frustrating because you're not sure exactly where God is, what He's wanting you to do. How many of you out there right now today are feeling the sense of, there's got to be something more. You've had it in your spirit for all these years that there's got to be something more. What you are about to watch tonight, this message that you're about to, to view, I believe is that missing link that's going to connect your heart, your mind, your soul, your emotions, the front of the book and the back of the book tonight. And I also want to challenge you tonight that most people, they say on, on, on Google Analytics, they watch a video for about six and a half minutes and then they tune out. I want to challenge you that every one of us go to theaters, every one of us go to movies, and we watch two and a half, three hours of movie, and we don't even want to get up to go to the bathroom. I want to challenge you to say that this message might very well rock your world to such a degree that if you watch it from beginning to end, it will challenge you, inspire you, it will bring you to a point of a new understanding of the Scriptures like you have never seen before. It will, it will mark and it will uh, create emotion inside of you that will connect you to the Lord God. I believe that's what His Word will do. So I want to challenge you. Watch this whole thing and see if God doesn't change you or at the very least challenge you to struggle with the Most High God. We are at the place where God wants to help us understand the signs. He wants us to understand His language. Because it's only when we understand the language that our mission changes. Barna Group, one of the nation's largest Christian polling agencies, says this, half of all adults, 50%, argue that a growing number of people they know are tired of having the same church experience. 71% say they'll develop their own slate of religious beliefs rather than accept a package of beliefs promoted by a church or a denomination. And only one-third, 34% of Christians today believe in absolute moral truth. 34%, ladies and gentlemen, of believers today believe in absolute moral truth. The problem, quote, facing the Christian church, they say, is not that people lack a complete set of beliefs. The problem is that they have a full slate of beliefs in mind, which they think are consistent with biblical teachings, and they are neither open to being proven wrong, nor to even learning new insights. It goes on to say, it may well be that spiritual evaluation is so uncommon because people fear that the results might suggest the need for different growth strategies or for more aggressive engagement in the growth process. No matter what the underlying reason is, the bottom line among both clergy and laity was this, indifference toward their acknowledged lack of evaluation. Let me re, re give, give that uh, you know, another spin. What they're basically saying in a nutshell is that God's people have come to a place where they feel like they've learned everything they're ever going to learn and they are completely indifferent and not interested in learning anything else or even, even entertaining the idea that they might possibly be wrong about anything related to their religious beliefs. When we come to a place where we put the car in neutral, ladies and gentlemen, it goes down the hill. It can only go when gravity to where gravity takes it. And I suggest in Christianity today, that's exactly where we are. We're at a place where no one wants to reevaluate. And I want to say that this is a Martin Luther moment. The 21st century is built. God in this day has built His people to start to ask the question, there's got to be something more. I'm missing something. Now is the time and today is the day that God's people begin to ask the questions and demand answers. Identity theft. Let's go in a different direction for just a second. Out of the top five consumer complaints in America, the number one complaint is identity theft. 14% of all consumer complaints are related to identity theft today. 
Now you might say, Pastor Jim, what does that have anything to do with what you're talking? It has everything to do with it. Because if you're new watching this, then you've probably never heard me say this before, but I say this all the time. Whatever happens in the physical realm, there is a spiritual message behind it. They parallel one another. Just as when Moses was building a tabernacle on earth, where did he get the pattern from? In the heavenly realm. So whatever happens in the earth realm, there are prophetic, hidden, shadowistic uh, 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 messages that are built into our lives everywhere. The problem is, is we don't know them. We don't see them. We don't have the spiritual eyes to know that when Jesus, when Yeshua, as I like to call him in his Hebrew tongue, when he cursed the fig tree, we don't even know why. We don't understand because we don't see in the prophetic realm. We don't see in the supernatural realm. We don't see the things that when, that when he walked along the sands of shore, the, 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 the sands along the shoreline, when he called the disciples, we don't even understand why they dropped their nets and followed him. We don't know the culture. We don't know the idiomatic uh, Hebrew expressions in the first century. We don't know our Bibles. And today, I believe that God's trying to give us a prophetic wink that your number one consumer complaint is identity theft, and what you don't know in the spiritual realm is the number one consumer complaint amongst God's people, even if they don't know it, is identity theft. Someone stole their identity, and they don't know it. And this message today, I believe, is going to unpack where we went wrong in our history and our history beliefs, because today we have 41,000 denominations. According to the Center of Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, 41,000. When I originally did this message back in 2009, there was 38,000. Let's count. 39, 40, 41. 3,000 more denominations have been added. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where you live, what your language is, and how you're watching, and where you're watching, but I can tell you this, that if you just take this one thought into consideration, 41,000 denominations, when Christ came to bring unity to the body of, uh, uh, as a whole, puts us in a crisis. This is by nature puts us in a crisis. The fact that we've got 41,000 different sects of Christianity tells us that we've got some problems. Because we're not going down, we're going up in our crisis. First things first, we have to know who we are. If you know who you are, then you will know your mission. Then you'll be able to read the signs. You see, I'm going to suggest something to you up front. Prove it to you as we move along. And at the very end, for some of you that are watching for the very first time, it's going to overwhelm you. It's the more Bible that you know right now, the more this message is going to impact you. Because the more that you understand who you are, as you read through the Scriptures, and we unpack what the real identity of God's people are, the Scriptures are going to come alive and you're going to see signs everywhere that you never saw before. Or signs that you thought were for a different people group that are now for you and that changes everything. So if you're afraid of change, you need to probably change the channel. Because this is not a message that is going to make you feel good. This is a message that is going to heal you and make you who you were originally meant to be. Listen, how important is this? Is how you define yourself determines which direction you go in your life. How you define yourself, how many of you without, without raising your hands have let your parents or let someone else tell you evil things about you and defined your life? Some traumatic thing happened in your life, it radically changed your identity and it radically changed the direction that you went. I'm here to tell you that it's real not just in psychology, it's real not just in relationships, it's real with your walk with God. You can actually be walking north and not be walking true north. In a compass, there are two norths. There is, there is regular north, and then there is true north. True north is exactly, perfectly north. How many know that if you just take a, a piece of paper, draw a line across it, we start in the middle, 
and we go in, in a, one line goes directly perpendicular to that page, that line straight up, and another goes just one degree off to the right. They're both going north. One is going perfectly north. So if you add 2,000 years since the, the, the dawn of our Messiah, that third day, and you just go off just a little bit, 2,000 years later, we've got 41,000 denominations, every one of them north. But how many have actually hit the destination that the Messiah intended? Tonight we're going to evaluate that, and we're going to back up our destinies to this sign, and we're going to make sure we read the sign correctly. There's lots of identities in the Bible. Let's just walk through them. We have obviously the Jewish people. There are Gentiles in the Bible. There's the Israelite identities. There's an identity called the house of Israel. There's the house of Judah. We're going to talk about those. Pagans and heathens. How many know the difference? Pagans are people that serve other gods. Heathens don't care. And then you have Christians. Well, Now there's a lot more identities in this. There's no way for me to go through the Hittites, Jebusites, and all the parasites. But I can tell you this. <laughs> there is, these are the main identities that we find in the Bible that we're going to walk through. Because how you define these identities completely determines how you define a lot of scriptures that are attached to them. But from Genesis to Revelation, hands down, no matter where you go, what you do, when you read the Bible, there is one singular, singular identity that stands out more than every other one, and that is Israel. Israel is the single most um, talked about. The entire Bible is about this small little tiny nation the size of New Jersey, around the Mediterranean Sea, Israel. And so let's, dis- let's find out what we're going to discover in this teaching. We're going to answer some questions, because here's what you're going to discover in this teaching. Number one, we're going to really finally understand what the one new man is. We're going to find out what the olive tree is of Romans 11. It wasn't just a metaphor. Paul wasn't making it up. We're going to find out why was Adam first created with Eve inside of him? You may never even have thought of that question, but we're going to answer it tonight. The entire prophetic timeline of Israel from Genesis to Revelation, we're going to answer. The deeper reason why Jesus or Yeshua really came, and by the way, if this, if this is the very first time that you've ever watched this, you may never even heard of the term Yeshua before. Yeshua is Jesus' Hebrew name. It's the original name that his mother called him, his father, all the disciples. Yeshua in Hebrew simply means salvation. Go figure God of the universe gives His own Son the name Salvation. When you think of Israel, what do you think of? I ask this question to people all the time. When you think of Israel, what is your thought process? So I wrote down the most common answers. The Jews, a country in the Middle East, Jacob of the Old Testament, the church, Christians. What, are your, what, what do you most likely think of when you think of Israel? Of one of those four or five things. We're going to go through those, and we're going to find out what is really the biblical definition. What is Israel? Who is Israel? What is it all about? But first, we've got common myths that we want to talk about. Number one, Christians have replaced Israel as the chosen people of God. That's called replacement theology. I'm going to define that for you tonight. I'm going to unpack that for you because it is the most misunderstood and unfortunately, the most held to belief when it comes to biblical theology of replacement of Israel and who is Israel, most people unfortunately fall into that definition of replacement theology. Israel of the Bible, another myth, is only comprised of the Jewish people. We'll talk about that. The Torah, which simply in Hebrew means instructions of God, was given only to the Jewish people and no one else. We'll find out if that's true. And the feast days of the Bible, such as Passover and Pentecost and so on and so forth, that the disciples kept our Jewish feast days. We'll talk about that as well. But first and foremost, let's talk about the first myth, which is replacement theology. It is the belief that the Christian church supersedes or replaces the Israelites in God's plan. And that the new covenant nullifies the biblical promises made to the children of Israel, including the Abrahamic covenant, the land covenant, and the Davidic covenant. In this view, the Jews who reject Jesus as the Jewish Messiah are consequently condemned by God, forfeiting the promises otherwise due to them under the covenants. That's according to Wikipedia. 
I love what Dr. Michael Brown has to say. Dr. Michael Brown is one of the leading Messianic Jewish apologists and theologians in the world today. He's written over 21 books. And some of his most popular books are uh, uh, helping Jewish people or combating the idea that Jesus cannot be the Messiah. Because he, being a Jewish person himself, he knows how they think. And uh, being a Messianic Jew, he wrote multiple books on how Jesus or why Jesus really is the Messiah. So he understands this topic significantly of replacement theology, and I love this quote. He says this, let's simplify things. To all those who reject the term replacement theology, do you believe that the national promises made to Israel in the Old Testament still apply to the Jewish people as a people? If not, you hold to a form of replacement theology, even if you don't even like the term. Okay? And so we're going to dive into this and discover exactly what this is. First of all, we deal with the Abrahamic covenant promise or the guarantee. God guaranteed to Abraham that his descendants would be blessed, period, guaranteed. This is an unconditional, irrevocable promise for as long as they live on this earth. Romans eleven twenty eight says it this way, Concerning the gospel, they are enemies' sake for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are what? Irrevocable. Now, we get confused on the reason why uh, replacement theology is there primarily is because they've never seen this message. Theologians do not understand the front of the book and how it relates to the back of the book, as I like to call it. But there are scriptures like this, where we're dealing with, let's say, salvation. And we all know that you cannot inherit the kingdom of God unless you believe in Yeshua through grace. Unless you have the faith to believe that He was sent by God, was, died for our sins, and rose from the dead three days later, you cannot be given that eternal grace. Everybody knows that inside of Christianity, both Messianic and Gentile alike. And that's where the confusion gets in is because the Abrahamic promises have nothing to do with salvation. Nothing. Let me ask you, if you are a firstborn son 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and almost in every culture, when your father passes away, what do you receive? You receive an inheritance. Do you know why? Because you have the same last name. It's not because you're a good guy. It's not because you're a bad guy, not because you're indifferent. It's because of who you know and who you're related to. It's because of the promises of the forefathers beforehand and the traditions passed down. Where Yahweh made, God made a promise to Abraham that your descendants will be blessed. Period. No way to get out of it. There was a land. There was, bless there was land blessing. There was other blessings. And it was a blessing that they would bless the earth. It had nothing to do with eternal life. Out of both kingdoms of the house of Judah and the house of Israel, which we'll talk about, it is Judah that can physically trace back their lineage to Abraham today. There's no one else that can trace back their lineage to Abraham than the Jewish people today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you and prove to you the blessings that God's people from the Old Testament have on their mark is incredible. Matter of fact, I love to tell a story that a friend of mine tells. He has a Jewish CPA. One day he walked into his office and he said, Jewish CPA, I have a question for you. And he says, you have Christians and Jews both on your books, right? As clients. He said, of course. And he said, which one is more wealthy, your Jewish clients or your Christian clients? And the CPA laughed out of sarcasm and said, well, my Jewish clients tend to one, actually. Ten times more wealth than the Christian clients. And so my friend said, well, what, what is it that makes them so, uh, so wealthy? What is the wealth? Where did the wealth come from? Uh, why are they so much more wealthy than, uh, than the Christian clients? And he says, um, he says, he picks a Bible up off of his desk and he says, it's real simple. You Christians read the back of the book, the New Testament, and all the financial principles are in the front of the book. That's why we're, we're more wealthy. Something to be said about that. 
But let's walk through all these incredible accomplishments and find out exactly if this is true, this Abrahamic covenant of without reproach. Did you know one quarter of 1% or 13 million of the entire population of the world are Jewish? One quarter of 1% are Jewish, yet of the 660 Nobel Prizes ever given, 160 were Jews. Not only that, Albert Einstein, I'm just going to go through some names because this blew my mind. Albert Einstein, these are all Jewish people. Sigmund Freud, Adam Sandler, doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> Art, Gunk, Art Garfunkel, Beth Midler, Barbara Streisand, Barbara Walters, Billy Crystal, Billy Joel, Bob Dylan, David Copperfield, Dustin Hoffman, Dr. Ruth, again, doesn't matter what you think. Elizabeth Taylor, Elvis Presley. Fred Astaire, Gene Simmons, Gene Wilder, George Michael, Harrison Ford, Henry Kissinger, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Seinfeld, Jerry Springler, Springer, for sure does not matter what you think. <laughs> Judy Garland, Kirk Douglas, Levi Strauss, Marilyn Monroe, the Marx Brothers, Mel Brooks, Neil Diamond, some of you are already singing songs in your head. Paul Newman, Paul Simon, Paula Abdul, Peter Green, Peter Falk. Roseanne Barr, Sean Penn, Steven Seagal, Steven Spielberg, and Woody Allen. Under President Obama, Ben Bernanke is the Federal Reserve Chairman. Rahm Emanuel, the White House Chief of Staff. David Axelrod, the President's Political Advisor. And Dan Shapiro, the top Middle East expert on National Security Council. Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And Jack Lew is Secretary of Treasury. Every one of those are Jewish. We're not done yet. Vanity Fair 2010 said out of the top 100 most powerful people, 51 were Jewish. Now get this, one quarter of 1% of the world's population. Do you get this? 13 million out of, out of, out of 6.5 billion and this is the percentages that they're making up in the most influential. 20% of the top billionaires are Jewish. And Sergey Brin, I think that's how you say it, founder of Google. Bet you didn't know that. Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook. Michael Bloomberg, mayor of New York City. And U.S. House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. All of them. Here are some inventions that the Jewish people have given us. The light bulb. I'd say that's a pretty decent one. Lasers, pacemakers, defibrillators, genetic engineering, GMOs. Oops. Okay, look, you know, it's not all that bad. They did give us stainless steel. How about uh, E equals MC squared? That's kind of important. Cholera and bubonic plague vaccines, the polio vaccine, nuclear weapons, capitalism, the pill cam. Did you know that your jeans were invented by the Jews? How many are wearing jeans right now? Raise your hand. <laughs> Praise God for Levi Strauss. Lipstick, the ballpoint pen, contraceptives, instant coffee. That should get a round of applause. Traffic lights, boo. Boo. Scotchgard, the flexi straw, could be useful in the Great Tribulation, you never know. All of Hollywood, TV sitcoms, the long plane record, and most of your favorite, Woodstock. Any movie that has sound, videotape, color television, it doesn't end. Pretty much most of the world, I think. Instant photography, holography, walkie-talkies, the blimp, fax machines, fiber optics, computer sand disk, all of these invented by the Jewish people. And by far the most important invention ever made by the Jewish people, according to every husband in every household, is the remote control. <laughs> what would we do without it? The bottom line is this, the Jewish people are hands down the most blessed people group worldwide. 
They have been more of a blessing to society than any other ethnic group per capita in modern history, period. The physical guarantee of the covenant blessings are regardless of the spiritual condition. Christianity cannot replace what is already being quoted and deemed as irrevocable. God said it. We believe it. We better back off. God blesses who He wants to bless. Amen? Abraham must have been one unbelievable guy because he blessed millions and millions and millions of people in his prodigy just because of his faithfulness. Let me ask a question. How many tribes were at the base of Mount Sinai? There were 12 tribes. Some of you that don't know this, there are 12 tribes under the patriarch uh, uh, Jacob. He had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. When God brought them out of the land of Egypt through Moses, He brought them across the Reed Sea. He brought them over to a place called Mount Sinai. And at the base of that Mount Sinai was all 12 tribes. Now you might say, Jim, why is that so important? Why are you stressing that? It's really important when we get to understanding this question. This myth, Israel is only the Jewish people. Now, if you are Jewish today, I understand that just the question that I'm asking is offensive. I'm asking you to put your emotions aside for just a moment. And let's let the Bible define itself. Let's take ourselves out from the year 2014. Let's take us out from modern day theology and religious circles and go back to the Bible during the time when those definitions were given and let the Bible define itself. According to Wikipedia, the origin of the word Jew is this. After the splitting of the United Kingdom of Israel and Judah into two, the name Yehudi was used for the southern kingdom of Judah. It thus ultimately originates in the biblical Hebrew word Yehudi, meaning from the tribe of Judah, from the kingdom of Judah or Jew. And so in other words, the word Jew comes from the southern kingdom. And we'll talk about that southern kingdom in extensity as we move forward. So as we go here, that was all introduction to bring us to this point where we're now going to walk through history. We're going to go back in time and we're going to go through the history of Israel, starting with Abraham. And we're going to work our way all the way through the book of Revelation and we're going to unravel this mystery, this identity crisis that has been spread worldwide. First of all, we start off with Abraham. And I titled this slide, Father Abraham the Gentile. Because there are not very many people in the world that, that would consider Abraham anything but a Jew. But Abraham was not Jewish. He wasn't even an Israelite. He was a Gentile. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, it says this, Terah took Abraham, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abraham's wife. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. He is a Chaldean. Abraham is a polytheistic background. He's a pagan Gentile living in the land of pagans. God calls from the land of pagans what would soon be a special people, a royal priesthood. Watch this. In Genesis 14, 13, it says, Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. This is the first time in the Bible that we get a clue of who Abraham is. They considered him a Hebrew. So this particular person that was from beyond the Euphrates River, they called a Hebrew, and it means to cross over, or the crossed over one. Now let's connect this to the Brit Hadashah, or the New Testament, and find, over, find out if we've got a connection here. John 5, 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed or crossed over from death to life. So the moment that Abram 
believed in the Lord God. Why was he called righteous, by the way? Because it said he believed in God. The moment that you believe in God, not intellectually, but in Hebrew, the word believe means to trust and obey. There's two concepts in Hebrew for belief. Or excuse me, there's one concept in Hebrew for believe, two in Greek. In Greek, you can believe intellectually, but never actually do anything about it. So you can say, I believe in God. That's why James says, well, I'm glad that you believe in God. Even the demons believe in God, and they shudder. In Hebrew, the concept of believe is I prove my belief intellectually by what I do. If you believe something intellectually, but you do something different, what is that called? A hypocrite. This is what the Pharisees were. They were saying with their mouth what they believed in their head, but their lives did not line up with that. So what God says is that if you actually believe in me, and instead of staying in Egypt, you actually come out of Egypt, and instead of staying there in fear, I'm going to test you at the the river, excuse me, at the Red Sea, and you actually cross over the Red Sea, you're a new creation. That word is Hebrew. You're a crossed over one. That's what Abraham was before there was anything. Christian, Baptist, Lutheran, there wasn't 41,000 different denominations to choose a title from. It literally was, I'm a crossed over one. Then we come to Jacob. Remember, Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob, on his way to meet his big brother Esau, and is very afraid, because 20 plus years had passed now, And since he's stolen Esau's blessing, Esau, the last time he talked to him, said, brother, as soon as dad dies, I'm taking you down, off with your head. So he knew this. So he's about to meet Esau, sends everybody on the other side of the the river. He stays on this side, and, and a man shows up, which we know to be Elohim himself in the form of an angel. Yahweh Sevaot is what it is in the Hebrew, the Lord of hosts. Shows up all over the Old Testament as a form of an angel. He struggles with God. And in this struggle, the angel touches his hip, which in Hebrew is connected to authority. Because whenever someone had a major oath or covenant that they were going to make, they would take the side of that right hip, right underneath that thigh, that thigh where the sword was, and that was a, the, the sword of authority. They were taking the thigh, the authority. That's when Abraham, remember the servant of Abraham, took Abraham's thigh and swore that he would find a bride for Isaac. The angel who could have destroyed Jacob in any moment waits till the very end and touches his thigh. What is he doing? He's touching his authority. He's breaking his authority because he's a terrible authority. What authority would send all of his family across the river and leave himself on this side so that he doesn't die? He makes him understand what real authority is by touching his hip, making him limp for just a moment, and then blesses him with something that he doesn't even understand the greatest blessing he could ever get is a changing of his name. Because at the moment that his name is changed, his mission changes. Because in Hebrew, every name has a mission. It has a meaning. So if you change the name from Yaakov, which means a deceiver, a supplanter, one who pulls the carpet out from people, and you change it to Israel, which means one who struggles with God, rules with God. You see, nobody gets to rule in God's kingdom unless they struggle first. And so I want to suggest to you, this is why James tells us to consider it pure joy. Because he was here. He understood this. He was here in this concept that when you struggle with God, you get a new name. You get to rule with Him. It is pure joy to struggle with the living God. Amen? All right, so that's on that timeline. So from there, they're in the land of Canaan. Then they end up in Egypt for 400 some odd years. And then they're making their trek back to Egypt, or excuse me, back to Canaan, back to the promised land. It's the same biblical pattern over and over again. We start in the garden, we get kicked out of the garden, and God's intent is to bring us back to the garden. Garden, Egypt, Egypt, back to the garden. In your life today, that's what God is doing. He's taking you from the place of which you originally were called in your destiny, in your spiritual life, of which you may not know what that is. 
You're in Egypt, and he's trying to pull you out of Egypt to get you back to what you were originally called to do. You are walking the same road as the Israelites. Some of you are still in the desert. Your mouth is dry. You have no leadership. You doubt your leadership. You don't even know where you're at. Some of you think you're in Canaan. If you were in Canaan, why are you so hot and sunburned? So we're standing at the Jordan River on this timeline. This is where our story truly begins. At the Jordan River is where this most prophetic statement is made by God Himself that determines the entire future of not only the Israelites, but you. Let me read it for you. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15 says this and following. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all of His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Then the Lord will scatter you among the peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known wood and stone. And Deuteronomy 29.1 says, These are the words of the covenant which Yahweh commanded Moses to make with the sons of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. So he's making a covenant with the sons of Israel right here at the Jordan River. Before they enter, this is 40 years have gone by. They're standing at the Jordan River. They're about to enter into what their parents never could see. And he says this, 13 verses later, Neither with you do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him who stands with us today before Yahweh our God, and also with him who is not here today. So he says, I'm not going to make this covenant just with you, the sons of Israel, but I'm going to make this covenant with someone else, everyone else that's not here today. What's he saying? Those that are not alive yet. Those that are in your loins, sons of Israel, he says, I'm making this covenant with not just you, but all of your progeny that comes after you. And who are those? The sons of God. Those are of the promise. They're the children of the promise. They're defined. The sons of God or the sons of Israel are, just, are called the children of the promise. They're also called the children of the covenant. It says, all the sons of Israel, which included this, Deuteronomy 29.10. Here's the definition of all those that aren't there. Your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers and all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and also the stranger who is in your camp. From the one who cuts wood to the one who draws your water. So we have to ask the question, theologians, we have got to ask the question, what is this stranger that he's talking about? Because we have all been taught that the covenants that were given to Israel were given to the bloodline Israelites. But right here, there is an exception. Because the stranger who's dwelling in their midst is not a native-born Israelite. But he is under the covenant. We'll come back to that. Then, they're in the land of Canaan. We come to the time of the kings. So the Israelites want a king, right? So God gives them Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. And here's where everything went wrong. Because under Solomon, these three kings, all 12 tribes were governed under one country, one nation, under God, indivisible, right? Right? Twelve tribes, one king, all together for three kings and three kings only. Until what? Until Solomon blew it. Big time. So bad, here's what God said in 1 Kings eleven thirty one. 31. He said to Jeroboam, the servant of Solomon, Take for yourselves ten pieces. For thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom of Israel out of Solomon's hand, and I will give you ten tribes. So he's giving Solomon's servant ten tribes to Jeroboam, and Rehoboam in the south is going to end up with two tribes. This is where the, two tri the, the ten tribes, the twelve tribes get split. Why does he do this? 
It says, because they've forsaken me and worship Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and have not walked in my ways to do what's right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments, as did his father David. Now, many of you in this room know this, but for, for you that are watching online, would it interest you to discover that the word Ashtaroth there is the same exact goddess, the bare-breasted fertility goddess of the East that's called Ishtar, the wife of the, the hated Baal of the Scriptures, of which uh, uh, you see God going after throughout the Scriptures all the time. Joshua at Mount Carmel, he is going against the prophets of Baal. Baal's wife is Ishtar. And if you follow Ishtar all the way down, did you know that the Anglicization, the English way of saying Ishtar is actually Easter? That's exactly right. I encourage you to get truth or tradition. Let's keep going. The kingdom is split. The ten tribes in the north were called the house of Israel, the house of Joseph, or the house of Ephraim. Okay, why? Because Jacob, his son, was Joseph. And from Joseph, the blessing went to Ephraim, which we'll talk about a little bit later. That's why they're called all three. The southern Israel, the southern part of Israel, the two tribes that were left, Judah and Benjamin, were called the house of Judah. So you've got the house of Judah in the south comprised of Benjamin and Judah. And then you have the northern ten tribes, the rest of Israel, in the north. That's called the house of Israel. House of Israel house of Judah. Where it gets confusing is the fact that it's called the house of Israel. Because in our lingo, in modern days, when we think of Israel, we think of the Jewish people. And even if we knew that Israel of the Bible was all 12 tribes, by saying house of Israel, by, we would by default, if we didn't know the split understanding, we would think of that as all 12 tribes. So it's important to understand that, that major difference. So then we, come, then we come to Genesis chapter 49 where the blessing is split. Now look, it, you have to understand this. In, in Israel culture, there were two major parts to an inheritance. You had the kingship, preeminence, priestly blessing. That goes to Judah in this case. And then you also had the double material portion blessing. That goes to Joseph. Neither one were the firstborn. Reuben was the firstborn. But he blew it. The next one blew it. The next one blew it. Judah was actually the fourth-born son. Joseph was the first-born son of Rachel, his favorite wife, the love of his life. So the, the, the blessing was actually split between Judah and Joseph. This is paramount to understand the rest of the Bible. If you don't understand that this blessing gets split right here, then you won't understand the rest of the Bible. It's not possible to understand who Israel is and how their timeline changes throughout history and what happens on their timeline because everything is connected to this. All the way through the book of Revelation even, prophecy is built on this statement, this blessing. So because God's people were warned that if they continued to break the covenant that was given to Abraham, then Noah, excuse me, to Adam, then Noah, then Abraham, and finally written down on tablets of stone, they would be taken away into captivity. They would be taken away into bondage. And this happened. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel, the house of Israel, was taken into captivity. Unfortunately, Judah, the house of Judah, played the harlot. She did not learn from her older sister and, uh, or his younger brother, however you want to take a look at it. And around 586 B.C., they were taken to Babylon for 70 years. So the, the northern house of Israel, all ten tribes, were taken into captivity in 722 B.C., and the southern kingdom was taken into captivity into Babylon. That one is the one that's most talked about. So this one is the one that people are most familiar with because it's the entire house of Judah. Even though not every single person was taken into captivity, we know this. Remember the whole story of Nehemiah is built on them coming back. They were there for 70 years. Why? Because they didn't let the land rest on the Shemitah years, on that Sabbath. 
God said, you're not going to, you're not going to keep my Sabbath. I'll take you into captivity for the exact amount of years that you didn't keep my Sabbath. And he let the land rest. When the house of Judah was allowed to go back to Jerusalem, most of all the Jews came back from Babylon. They went into Jerusalem. They rebuilt the walls. But the northern house of Israel never came back. The northern house of Israel assimilated into the nations all around the Mediterranean area. They were pushed. They never came back. This is why the only people that are part of Israel today, the Jews that we see today, if they would not have come back from Babylon so many years ago, there would be no Jewish people today. Therefore, you would not be wearing Levi Strauss jeans. If the Jewish people had not come back, they wouldn't even exist. There would be nothing but Gentiles worldwide. Think of the implications of this. Why God had to raise up someone like Nehemiah if it wasn't for Nehemiah. This world would look a lot different. Prophecy would look a lot different. Let me say this. Without them coming back from Babylon, Jesus himself doesn't exist. The whole lineage is banking that they maintain their identity with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 1 says this. We're going back to the Jordan River. It shall come to pass when all these things come to you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God, and you return to the Lord your God and obey His voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from the nations where the Lord God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord God will gather you and from there He will bring you. Then the Lord God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed and and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and your heart of your descendants to love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength that you may live. You see, Jesus, Yeshua, was not the first one to say to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He was saying what He had already written all the way back here. At the base of Mount Sinai, God says, I put before you blessings and curses. Blessings if you keep my commandments. Curses if you don't. And like I say all the time, sometimes the greatest curse is the blessings that you don't even know you've missed. Sometimes we go through our whole lives and we make terrible decisions and we say, well, I'm blessed. I'm still blessed. God loves me. Look at my life. What you don't know is what you missed. What you could have been. Someone pointed out to me one time and it's radically impacted my life. Hell, fire, and damnation would, does not scare me near as much as dying and sitting before the judgment seat of the throne of Christ and meeting the Jim Staley I could have been. That would be the scariest day in my, in my existence is to meet the person I could have been. Because we're not only, ladies and gentlemen, going to get, get, get uh, judged by the things we do wrong. And we get rewards by the things that we do right. We are also going to be judged by the difference of who you could have been. You say, well, Jim, that's not fair. No, no, no. It is fair. Because when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit say to witness this person and you're in public and you're embarrassed and you know God is pressing it upon your heart to pray with them, meet with them. You know, the the waitress comes and you can see the tears filling up her eyes. You know God is telling you to ask her what her name is and if you can pray for something and you refuse to do it. And then on judgment day you meet that that person would have become an evangelist that would have led 250,000 people to Christ. And those 250,000 people could very well be on your head. That's the person 
that you could have become. God is telling us in this moment, at this place, right at the Jordan River, He tells them, He says, I'm going to give you a rah-rah. When you go into the camp, don't forget about me. Don't forget about the covenant that I gave you. Don't forget about the covenant of your forefathers. Don't forget that your fathers and your mothers don't get to come because you have faith. But when you go and cross over, you're going to forget. And I'm going to have to scatter you into the four corners of the earth. You're going to, he's prophesying the northern kingdom going into Assyria and the southern kingdom going into Babylon. He says that I know you're going to forget and I'm going to scatter you everywhere. You're going to lose your identity. You're going to forget who I am. You're not even going to like who I am. You're going to forget my commandments. You're going to forget my name even. But when you remember, I will draw you back to myself. I will bring you home. I will call you by name. The trumpet blast and the shofar blast will go out to the four corners of the earth. And I will call my sheep back to green pastures. Amen? All right. Well, so now we are back at the Jordan River. God gives them this prophetic message. He gives them this encouragement. But quite frankly, it's not much of an encouragement if you're, if you're telling them, hey, I'm your God. I know you love me. This is Joshua generation. I'm excited for you guys. You're going into the ground of Canaan. I'm going to be with you. You're going to see amazing things. Walls come down. Giants are going to fall. But hey, by the way, you're going to blow it. I'm going to have to scatter you throughout the entire world and your lives are going to fall apart. That's pretty much exactly what's happening right here at the Jordan River. But he gives them this tremendous promise that if you repent, I will let you come back. So now we come and we have this, uh, with this concept called scattered sheep because God's people are called His bride. They're called sheep. And they're called several other things that we're going to talk about because these, these names mean something. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 17 says, Israel is like scattered sheep. The lions have driven Him away, directly connected to this prophetic message. Micah chapter 2, verse 12, amazing, amazing book, one of my favorite. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise be, noise because there is so many people. So over and over again, Israel is called sheep, scattered sheep. Ezekiel 34, 12 says, As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he's among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they've been scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. Again, a direct reference to the northern house of Israel and Israel in general being scattered into the nations. The point I want to bring out here is Israel is the only people in the Bible called sheep. There is no other group in the Bible that has this definition. Theologians and students of the Bible, it is critical that we do not read from the New Testament into the Old Testament because the New Testament was written from the foundation of the Old Testament and the New Testament writers were pulling the theology and the definitions that they were writing from their existing framework within Judaism. They would not have changed the definitions from the what we call the Old Testament, what they called the Hebrew Scriptures. So I want to ask a million dollar question, where are the scattered sheep that he talks about? Where did he scatter them? You know where they are at? The Bible says they're among the Gentiles. Let's walk through this. Amos chapter 9, verse 9. You're going to start to make connections already. For look, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among the Gentiles. Notice right here, he says, I'm going to sift the house of of Israel. This is really important. Why I told you earlier, you've got to understand the difference between the house of Israel in the north and the house of Judah in the south. There is not a time in the Bible where Israel, all 12 tribes, are called the house of Israel. It is the house of Israel in the north and the house of Judah in the south. So in Amos chapter 9, verse 9, he is being very specific. 
And it's for a reason, because it's the northern house of Israel that was prophesied to be scattered into the four corners of the earth. Not the southern kingdom. Some of them were scattered, but it was the north that was prophesied to be amongst all of the the nations. So he says, I will sift the house of Israel among the Gentiles, telling us that they're going to be found among the Gentiles. Look at this. Ezekiel eleven sixteen 16 says, therefore say, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, and although I've scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary. The word there is Mishkan. I shall be a tabernacle, a temple for them in the countries where they have gone. Let's continue because it's not just a couple, they're everywhere. Psalms 106, 47 says, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Ephraim becomes mixed. It says in Hosea chapter 7, verse 8, Ephraim has mixed himself amongst the peoples, amongst the nations. Ephraim is a cake unturned. He's half-baked. Aliens have devoured his strength, but he doesn't even know it. So Ephraim, the northern, which is what the northern house of Israel was called, scattered throughout the nations, he becomes half-baked, he becomes mixed, he doesn't even know who he is, and he doesn't even know that his strength has been stripped from him. He doesn't even know the blessing that he doesn't have. Hosea chapter 8, verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now they are among the Gentiles like a vessel in which there is no pleasure. The ten tribes, listen to this, listen to this. The ten tribes were taken into captivity and dispersed across all of Assyria. Over time, they assimilated into the nations and they became as Goyim, Gentiles. They knew their identity. This is important. They had not lost their identity at this point. They knew their identity. The entire time that they were amongst the Gentiles, they knew their genealogy. They knew that they were from the tribe of Dan. I'm, a, you know, I'm from Naphtali. I'm from Asher. I'm Gad. But over time, they became indistinguishable, indistinguishable in word and deed. In other words, they may have knew their family genealogy, but they acted and talked dressed, looked just like the rest of the world. They had no idea. People had no idea which one was a tribe of Dan, which one was this person, that person. From from a Greek's perspective, this is my friend, he's a Greek. They don't even know. Now that person knows. They know themselves where they come from, but most likely no one else did because they assimilated into the culture. By the New Testament times, these next couple slides are so critical. Listen to me. The New Testament times, most still knew which tribe that they were from and lived across the Euphrates River, exactly what Josephus says. He says that they lived by the millions across the Euphrates River. In the New Testament, even the Jews knew the northern ten tribes that by the millions lived across the, the Euphrates River. They were not allowed to be part of Israel. And I'll explain that a little bit later. This is really important theology to understand. But over the past 2,000 years, they would completely lose their identity. Completely lose their identity as the house of Israel, totally fulfilling the prophecy. So the northern ten tribes of Israel, taken into captivity in Assyria, scattered throughout the then known world, lived across the Euphrates River in the first century in the time of Christ, but over the last 2,000 years since the destruction of the temple, not only did they, they, we have no idea who they are, they don't know who they are. Josephus says this, a Jewish historian in the first century, wherefore there are but two tribes in Asia and Europe subject to the Romans, while the ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates till now and are immense multitude and not to be estimated by numbers. What is he telling us? The first century historian is telling us that Israel of the first century was comprised 
of Judah and Benjamin. The two tribes right there. Two tribes right there. The other ten tribes are across the river. That's why it was Jews that were part of the Sanhedrin. There was no tribe of Dan. And Dan, by the way, was a judge. So there's no other tribes. That's why Paul says he's from which tribe? Benjamin. Okay? Because that's what Israel was comprised of. No one else was allowed to be part of Israel unless you converted to the first century rabbinical form of religion called Judaism in the first century. Then you could be part of Israel. But you had to convert to the southern kingdom. Does that make sense? Okay. If not, hit stop, rewind. From modern Jewish scholars, the captives of Israel exiled beyond the Euphrates did not return as a whole to Palestine along with their brethren, the captives of Judah. At least there is no mention made of this event in the documents at our disposal. In fact, the return of the ten tribes was one of the great promises of the prophets and the advent of the Messiah is therefore necessar- necessarily identified with the, re- the epic of their redemption. What is he saying? The reason why I'm showing you this is because uh, a lot of the Jewish people today will tell you that they've returned from captivity. That Israel is the Jewish people. Jewish people is all of Israel and <clears throat> the ten tribes have returned. But the rabbis and the academics and the scholars will tell you, no, we know that there is a difference. Whether or not that difference actually gets passed down to the laity inside of Judaism in the synagogues is one thing. But at the top of the scholastic academic theological food chain in Judaism, they know that there are two houses. They know that Israel today is only of the two tribes in the south. They know that the ten tribes are still lost. Matter of fact, the Orthodox pray for the the ten tribes three times a day. And so we can't say that anybody has returned from the ten tribes, that the ten tribes have returned because the prophets say that it hasn't happened yet, and even modern scholars say it hasn't happened yet. Even in the Mishnah, which is a compilation uh, of Jewish uh, history and writings uh, and uh, halakha. There is uh, writings in the Mishnah of, of two rabbis, and <clears throat> Rabbi Akiva, his view is this on the ten tribes. The ten tribes will not return, for it is said, and cast them into another land as it is this day. Just as the day goes and does not return, so they too went and will not return. So Rabbi Akiva says, about the ten tribes, he says they're not going to return. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is to show that this is after the time of Christ. This is hundreds of years later, and they're still talking about whether or not the the tribes should return. So it could not have happened in the first century, or Judaism itself would not even be having this this conversation. Because Rabbi Eliezer says in response, As this day, just as this day, darkens and then becomes light again, so the ten tribes, even as it went dark for them, so will it become light for them. So the point is, is that we've got written record of two rabbis going at it saying, I don't believe they're going to come back. I do believe they're going to come back. So what by default can we deduct from both of those? They're not back. Even the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The IMFA says this, The exile to Babylonia, which followed the destruction of the first temple in 586 B.C., marked the beginning of the Jewish diaspora. Do you realize how important this is for the IMFA to make this statement? Because the northern kingdom was exiled 130 years earlier. By default, they're admitting that the first dispersion was not the Jewish people, but the house of Israel. For you Gentiles, this may not be an important message, but I know for my Jewish brethren, this is an important slide. Because you have all been taught, generically, that the Jewish people were dispersed, and that was all 12 tribes. But even your own organizations 
again, at the highest levels of academia, admit that the first dispersion of the Jewish people was 586 B.C. going to Babylon because that's the house of Judah. Let's get into the New Testament a little bit, and let me ask this paramount question. Have you ever wondered why pagan Gentiles who hated the Jews, anti-Semitic as they come, would so readily accept a Jewish Messiah? So a rabbi, Paul, Rav Shaul, in his Hebrew tongue, is going around to different cities, and he's supposedly preaching to pagans. And 100,000 people convert to Christ in just the city of Ephesus. All of these are polytheistic pagan gods, sun god worshipers. they got a thousand different gods. They don't even need another god, much less a Jewish god of which they can't stand to begin with. Why would they accept a Jewish Messiah? I'm going to suggest to you something, because many of these Gentiles were not pagan Gentiles. They were Israelite Gentiles. Let's dig into this and find out if this crazy theory is true. Peter says this in verse 1, now you have some definitions from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, we can actually unravel some incredible mysteries in the New Testament. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Right off the bat, where Paul, Peter is using terminology that he's not making up. Every one of his Jewish brethren knows that the word scattered comes from the prophecies of scattering the northern house of Israel. There's only one people in the entire Bible that are called the elect, and that is Israel of the Old Testament. Now, some of you, that might bother you, but let me finish what I'm going to say. We've been talking for hundreds of years now trying to figure out this whole doctrine of election. Books have been written, Calvinism, Arminianism, you know, uh, one saved, always saved, you know, you can, all these things. The doctrine of election is very simple, G- and predestination is very simple. God elected His people, scattered them, predestined for the elect to come back. That is the definition of predestination right there in a nutshell. You can't look at it from your 21st century Western Greco-Roman post-Catholic backgrounds in English. But if you dive into the original, the original Scriptures and you dive into the Tanakh and the Old Testament and the Hebrew Scriptures and the concepts that are there, it's God's people are elect. He moves them into captivity and a select elect those that obey His voice and and His his commandments and His ordinances and so on and so forth, become the remnant that are predestined to come back. And that's what we see in the New Testament. And I want to point out something else here that's really interesting. Peter tells us that the scattered are throughout Pontius and what? Galatia. You Bible students should be asking yourself, oh my goodness, who is the book of Galatians really written to? It's not just these pagan Gentiles. Could it possibly be that part of the Israelite Gentiles that are found among the Gentiles, that lost their identity, that know who they are but have forgotten their God, that this is part of the people group that's in Galatia? Could it be possible that when Paul walks into Galatian city, that the reason why they accept the message so fast is because they've heard part of it before. They just haven't had the solution or the mystery solved. They knew the mystery, but they knew there was no solution. And I'm going to share with you a little bit later why they got so excited by the thousands to come to Christ. Because they knew the problem, they knew there was no solution, and the Apostle Paul comes around with good news. We're going to talk about what that good news is. James says this in his book, first verse, 
First chapter, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who were scattered abroad. His book is to the twelve tribes. Bible students, listen to what I'm saying. It's not written to Gentiles. He's telling us who it's written to. He's writing to the tribes of Israel. All twelve, in fact. Gentile Israelites? John chapter 7, verse 33. Let's get crazy for a second. Jesus therefore said, Yet a little while I am with you, and I will go to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The disciples and those listening are a little bit confused at this moment because they're thinking, where is he going that, that we can't follow him? And that's exactly what they said. They said, the Jews therefore said amongst themselves, where is this man going to go that we're not going to find him? Will he go to the dispersion amongst the Greeks and teach the Greeks? You see, we look at this and we go, is he going to go talk to the Gentiles? Is he going to go teach the Greeks? Because we don't read the front of the book to understand what the dispersion amongst the Greeks means. There's a prophecy about the northern house of Israel being dispersed amongst the Greeks. So they're saying, in effect, is this man going to fulfill prophecy and go and speak to the northern house of Israel? From which, by the way, we've created a man-made tradition and doctrine of law within our own religious system that says you can't do that. You've got to know the cultural history to know there was a law on the books that you could not talk to the dispersion or a Gentile. You could not eat with them. Why do you think Peter gets in trouble for going to Cornelius' house? It's not a biblical law. It's a Jewish oral law in the first century. They're basically saying, the Jews amongst themselves are saying, he would not dare go there. That's why he says, by the way, where I'm going, you won't go. You won't find me because you'll never think to look there. Now we know who the sheep are. Watch this because all these verses are going to pop out like 3D. John chapter 10 verse 3 says, The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When... When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow because they know his voice. Now, every one of us have grown up in church, have always read these scriptures because when you get saved, where do they start you? John. At the back of the book. That's like handing you a novel and saying, go to chapter 13 and start there. You'll learn everything you need to know. (laughs) But like my friend says, God is so smart that He knew we were going to send everybody to John chapter 1, verse 1, which is why it starts out saying, in the beginning. (laughs) He's trying to tell us something. Go back to the beginning. Don't start here. And if you go back to the beginning, what you discover is, As the only definition, as we have explained, the only definition of sheep in the entire Bible, from this author's perspective, these Jewish authors' perspective, is the sheep are equal to the tribes of Israel. So when you get to the New Testament and Yeshua, Jesus is giving these analogies and these parables and these stories about sheep, who do you think he's talking to and referring to? And look what we have done in our third grade education in theology as Christians worldwide, according to theologians, by the way. As we have read into the New Testament Scriptures, oh, we are the sheep. Actually not even knowing what we're really saying. John chapter 10, verse 7, another one. Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. If you know the Bible, this should start to get excited. If you think I'm fired up now, you wait till the end. Because what is Yeshua saying? There's a pen. There's a, there is a cage, if you will. There's a fence. 
And there are sheep that are outside the fence. They're scattered throughout the nations. And he says, guess what? I'm the gate for them to come back. You Jews say that they can't come back. You southern kingdom say it's not possible for them to come back. And you actually have chapter and verse to back it up, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But I'm telling you right now, I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the eastern gate to the holy of holies. I am the temple itself and the eastern gate. He says there's only one way to get to the Father, and that's through me. Let's continue. Who is Peter talking about when he says this? In chapter 2, verse 9 of his own book, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I encourage you, if you're watching this online, do not shut this off. We are about to get to some of the most exciting things that you have ever seen. In your word, in the Bible. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we start off new believers in the book of John, we do not even understand that he is quoting this entire verse, these two verses, from the prophets. And you've got to know this prophet statement. You've got to know the scriptures that he's quoting from because if you don't go back to the scriptures he's quoting from, you're going to miss who he's really talking about. Because again, I'm going to suggest to you, because of our 41,000 denominational backgrounds, and because we don't know the front of the book, we're never told to run to the front of the book, we're told that they're Bible stories for children all the way up to 10, and after that, they're only good for bedtime stories. It's just history. It has no prophetic meaning. We put no value on it. Even though in the book of Timothy, it says that all Scripture is worthy for correction, for doctrine, for reproof, in ways, in right, ways of righteousness. And did you know when that was written, there was no New Testament. The only scriptures he was talking about were the Torah, the saints, and the prophets. And he considered that worthy for all doctrine. So let me ask our seminary students and theological students today and professors that are watching this right now, can we be th- just intellectually honest and say today in Christianity, we put this much value on the New Testament And we put this much value on the Old Testament. When the apostles, when they wrote the New Testament, put this much value on the Old Testament, and they didn't even consider this New Testament. Does that make sense? But we all want to be like Acts chapter 15. We all want the power of God. We want the apostolic anointing. But we don't use the anointing that the apostles had and used. We don't even use the same book that they used. The New Testament is no doubt inspired. But listen, like someone told me once, the New Testament is simply the Old Testament revealed. And the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. If you don't know the Old Testament in these prophets, you're going to miss right through this. So let's find out exactly what this means. What is this once people that were not a people? It does sound like the Gentiles. Doesn't that sound like the Christian church? You were not a part of God, and now you are part of God. You didn't have compassion, and you now have mercy. Sounds nice, sounds spiritual, even sounds uh, theologically sound. Let's test it. Because he's actually quoting from somewhere. Exodus 19.6 has another exact quote. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. This is part of the scripture he's quoting. And a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So in the Bible, there's a law called the law of uh, uh, hermeneuticals. Uh, excuse me. The hermeneutical, one of the hermeneutical principles is the law of precedent. And it says that the first time that something is used tells you the definition. It tells you how it's used the rest of the scriptures. So this is telling us that the kingdom of priests and a holy nation phrase, he's speaking to the children of Israel. Hermeneutically speaking, and seminary students will tell you this, you can't change it. It's illegal. You cannot change what God said is this is the definition. If God said that the the, the children of Israel are likened unto uh, uh, blossoms in a garden, You cannot say they're rocks. You can't do that. Whatever he says 
is what it will always be. So if he says that the children of Israel are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, then any time that you see the New Testament authors use that, you have to ask yourself, where did they get that from? They didn't make it up. They're quoting Scripture because they're trying to make a case to the Jewish people that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. So they're going to use their own Scriptures against them. Let's continue. But more powerfully, by the way, I want to go back to this Scripture, and I want you to remember this. In verse 10 of 1 Peter 2, which we're going to talk about, is this phrase. I just went over a royal priest and a holy nation, showed you how it's connected to the children of Israel, but what I want to focus on is this phrase, that you were not a people, but now you are a people. Watch where that comes from a little bit later. Many of the people whom Paul preached to were from the northern house of Israel. No questions asked that the majority, I believe, of the people that Paul is actually preaching to. When he says that I'm the apostle to the Gentiles, of course there are pagan Gentiles or heathen Gentiles and Gentiles that are real Gentiles that were never Israelites to begin with. But I'm here to tell you, as the sky is blue, that our Bible tells us in the language that Paul is using, what he actually means by apostle to the Gentiles and who he is really talking to is the scattered northern house of Israel that the southern house of Israel called wild dogs and Gentiles. Paul says this. Let me just prove this because I know some of you are crossing your eyes. Romans chapter 9, verse 24. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now watch this. Bible students, watch this. I will, I will call them my people who were not my people. So he just defined, he says that God's not going to call just to us Jews only, but also to the Gentiles, because he says, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of of the living God. And that may not be a, mean a whole lot to you right now, but if you knew that that was a direct quote from Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, then you would go there. And we would find out exactly who are the not my peoples. Because that's who's being talked about. That's who Paul is directly referencing, is the people who were called not my people. And he defines those as Gentiles. And I can assure you, Paul, who studied studied under Gamaliel and was the most zealous of all, he says, students of Gamaliel, and just to study under Gamaliel, you had the entire Torah memorized. This is the elite of the elite of the elite. Let me ask you a question. Paul was chosen by the Most High God on his way to Damascus to kill Christians, was he not? Does God need to choose the highest academic theological student of the entire first century to go talk to pagans that don't know come here from Sikkim? Do you have to choose Thomas Edison to teach first grade math? There's a reason why God chose the genius, Paul. Because he is commissioned to prove something theologically to both the Jews and to these Israelite Gentiles who know their background and know that they cannot be part of Israel. And God chooses him because he knows more of the Scriptures and has a pizzazz and a zeal and a tenacity about him that he won't ever quit, he'll never give up, and even when I throw him in chains, he will see the vision and he will continue to go after my scattered sheep. That's why Paul was chosen. But let's go back to this in Hosea chapter 1, verse 4, and let's read it because this is where Paul is quoting from. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel. For yet a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. There we go, the prophecy again. I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. For I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. Remember that? He said, those who have had no compassion. 
but I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God. He goes on to say five verses later, For you, house of Israel, are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the very place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. What you have just heard with your own ears is what Paul says in the New Testament is the mystery. How can the sons of the living God be His people? Then he says, they're not going to be my people. I'm not going to be their God anymore. And then he says, in this very place that I'm telling them they're not going to be my people and I'm not going to be their God, in that very place they will become sons of the living God. Now, if you don't have the rest of the Bible, that is a little confusing. That's why they called it a mystery. Let's keep going on this. Let's read it again. Romans chapter 9, verse 24, it says this, Even us whom He called, not of the southern kingdom only, but He called of the Gentiles. And he says in Hosea, I will call them, who's them referring to in Paul's context, the Gentiles, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you're not my people in that place, you'll be called sons of the living God. So what Paul is saying is if, if Paul is not referring to the house of Israel, Every Bible student that went to the seminary knows you got to throw out every two-thirds of the New Testament has to be thrown out because he's breaking hermeneutical principle. You cannot change what God says. You don't change definitions. This is how we end up with 41,000 denominations. We change definitions. If, you, if Paul can change the definition of what Hosea says is the people that are not my people that will be my people, then you can change the name of the Messiah. Because it doesn't end. You can change everything. Every prophecy that's written can be changed. Nothing can be trusted. When God defines what the entire Messiah is going to look look like, you can throw it out and change it, and everyone will do whatever is right in its own eyes. And I suggest that is exactly what we have done. This is why 70 some odd percent of our young people by the end of their first year in college deny Christ. Because we're not giving them any standard, no foundation. All the definitions have changed. They see right through it. It's not right. The anointing of God is not on anything but His own Word. And when you change it, there's a curse according to my Bible. We better start interpreting the Bible and letting the Bible interpret itself. And this is right here. The Bible inter- But if this was only one scripture, uh, Jim, you know, I think you're stretching it. Let's find out. Because this is critical. Let's go to Hosea chapter 2. By the way, the entire book of Hosea is about the northern house of Israel. Go back and read it, all 14 chapters. Every chapter is about the, the whole entire house of Israel. So if you want to find out about the scattered sheep, that book has more, almost more information about it than anything. So we're just going to walk through all the scriptures in the whole book. Say to your brothers, Ami, And your sisters, Ruhamah, contend with your mother. Contend, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Then I will give her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. What's the whole book of Hosea about? Hosea does what? Gets a word from God that he has to marry a prostitute named Gomer. Has three children. And those three children are prophetic of the northern house of Israel and their journey. And he says that he's going to divorce the northern house of Israel. She's not my wife. Hosea 2.23 says, I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her. So even though I'm going to get rid of her, even though I'm going to divorce her because she's a prostitute. It's the whole prophetic story. I will have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. 
And I will say to those who are not my people, the children of Gomer, the divorced wife, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. So this is a future event where the children of the house of Israel that were divorced are going to come back into covenant and they're going to say, you are my God. And there's going to be a revival. So in the last days, this is awesome, chapter 3, verse 5 of the same book says, Afterwards, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to His goodness in the last days. This is a prophetic timeline given to us that at the end of time, is when this scripture is going to happen. At the end of time is when, remember, they were at the river getting that message, that not so good cheerleading message that when you go into the land, you Joshua generation, you're going to blow it. I'm going to scatter you out all the kingdoms and all the nations of the earth in the four corners, but you're going to hear my shofar blast and I'm going to gather the house of Israel. I'm going to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel and I'm going to bring them back. We now know when that happens. The last day. This has not happened yet. So why were they divorced? Hosea 4, 6, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Look what, how he defines knowledge, by the way. Because you've rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten, rejected, the law, in, in Hebrew that's Torah, of your God. I also forget your children. So he says that knowledge of God is directly related to his law. You forget the law, you have no knowledge. Because I am the law. I am the word made flesh. You don't know me because you don't read Moses and the prophets, Lazarus and the rich man's story. Oh, but God, it's hot down here. If you, if you, if you uh, just let me go talk to them or let my brother, I will tell my brothers that this is really, so look, if they, don't, if they don't know about me, they're never going to know about me because Moses wrote about me. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them read the Moses and the prophets. It's all about me. What's he saying? They don't have any knowledge because they don't know my law. Don't forget it. He says, or I'll forget your children. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. Malachi 2.7. I only put that in there to make a connection, a little, rabbi, a little rabbi trail for just a moment, that the knowledge of God, according to the Scriptures, and all through the book of Proverbs, go back and look at Proverbs and do a word search on just the word knowledge, and you'll be blown away. That knowledge is connecting to, connected to seeking God's law, His commandments. Knowledge is knowing who He is. Knowing who he is is knowing right and wrong. On the third day, watch this, Hosea 6.1, incredible book. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, he will raise us up. That we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. Let's go back to what we forgot. His going forth is established in the, as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Hosea 8.1 says this, Set the trumpet to your mouth. He shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my Torah. Israel will cry to me, My God, we know you. Israel has rejected the good. Talking about his law. The enemy will pursue him. Now what I want to do is I want to connect this to a statement that's found in Matthew. Compare this with Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, on judgment day, Lord, we have not prophesied in your name. Have we not cast out demons in your name? Done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now let's go back to Hosea 8.1, when it says, My God, Israel will cry, My God, we know you. And God says, You've rejected my law. Your lawlessness. Do you see the connection? Do you think that it's just coincidence 
that the writer of Matthew here, that this chapter, Yeshua is telling us, is just not connected at all? Or could he possibly be connecting these two scriptures? Hosea 8.10, again, yes, they have hired among the, the nations. Now I will gather them. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. To the house of Israel, the Torah is a strange, weird thing. That's what the prophecy is going to be. If you haven't noticed already, we're walking through the book of Hosea. In 9.17, it says, My God will cast them away because they did not obey Him, and they shall be wanderers among the nations, among the Gentiles. But in chapter 12, he says this in verse 6, So you, by the help of your God, return. Observe mercy and justice and wait on God continually. And in the last chapter, he says this in the first verse, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your sin, your iniquity. Those who dwell under His shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. And so the whole book of Hosea is about the northern house of Israel getting divorced and being scattered to the nations and coming back. It's good news. The mystery is, how is that going to happen? So now we're going to go into Romans chapter 11, one of the most misunderstood chapters of the New Testament. Verse 24, For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So we've got an olive tree. We've got a wild olive tree. We've got a, a cultivated olive tree. And we've got from the olive tree, we've got broken branches and other branches being grafted in. That's what's going on. We've got an agricultural example going on here. So what is an olive tree? A good Bible student would say, where is Paul getting this concept from? Where is he getting this idea of an olive tree? Is he making that up? Why wouldn't he say peach tree? He could have said anything. He said olive tree. It's one reason and one reason only. The same reason why God chose him because he's a genius. And he knows the word of God. And he knows prophecy and how it all lines out. Because you go back to Jeremiah 11. It's the only place in the Bible that tells us the definition of an olive tree from God's perspective. Speaking about his people Israel. The Lord called your name green olive tree tree lovely and of good fruit with the noise of a great tumult it was kindled fire on it and its branches are broken this scripture i even think it's interesting that it's jeremiah 11 and it's connected to romans 11 it's the same scriptures broken branches of an olive tree all israel all 12 tribes were called an olive tree and there were branches that were broken so we have the two trees, this one tree is split into two trees. And interestingly enough, this becomes the symbol that the prophet sees as the seal or the actual national identity of Israel is a menorah flanked by two olive trees. This is the actual flag of Israel, if you will. The identity symbol of Israel, according to the scriptures, is the menorah which is the seven-branched candlestick that stood in the holy place, which represented the Word of God, that is, is light for the two olive trees that are the two houses of Israel. We turn to Ezekiel 37 to add a little bit of weight to this. Verse 16, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick. That word there, by the way, is tree in the Hebrew. And they will become one in your hand. And that's why the writer puts the word stick there, because he, he is assuming that the reader is going to cross his eyes if, if he writes that on one tree write Judah, on another tree write Ephraim, and make uh, the two trees come together in the hand. Well, one hand can't hold two trees together in one. And that's why they put stick in your Bible. 
But I'm going to tell you that the man that he's talking about created the heavens and the earth. His hand's big enough to hold two trees. They should have put trees. Because it's two olive trees. One with Judah, one with Joseph. The two come together and become one again. Verse 21, then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations again. I am beating this into the, into the ground because it's so critical. And I will make them one nation in the land. One king will be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor this shall ever be divided again into two kingdoms. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, talking about Yeshua, Jesus. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall all work or walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. This is a millennium messianic prophetic scripture. It hasn't happened yet. And right here, we've got a scripture telling us that not only are the two sticks going to come together, the two nations are going to come together, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, led by Jesus himself, but it says that everyone's going to walk in my Torah. That's in the millennium. Now, I know that's a whole other topic, but that's what it says. They're going to walk in my judgments. That's for a whole other discussion. Verse 25, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of what? This mystery of how they come together. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness, we're back in Romans 11, in part has happened to Israel, speaking of the Israel that existed in the first century, because that was the definition in the first century to the Jews, was they were the only Israel that existed, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so it says that blindness in part has happened to the southern kingdom until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. Let's keep going. Have you ever wondered why it says this? And so all of Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from the house of Israel, from Jacob. Why would he say all of Israel is going to be saved? I always grew up thinking, well, all the Jewish people are finally going to get saved. That's great. It's about time they get on board. How arrogant. We don't even know the Bible. Paul's excited here, and he's talking about the mystery of the two sticks coming together in the, two, in the one hand of the Messiah. That's the mystery. And when that happens, it says... All Israel will be saved. All 12 tribes will be saved. There's a whole other message that's built into this that Paul understands. He's trying to explain it. Why do you think he say, they say that, that the things that Paul says is hard to understand? He's a theologian trying to unpack the, some of the most incredible prophecies of all time that no one ever, up until now, ever put together, and he's putting it together. And he's helping people. That's why they're getting saved. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. What sins? What sins? Let's talk about the one new man. All right, the one new man. Let's dig into the one new man. This has been a mystery for so long. Books have been written. If you go to your local Christian bookstore, you will find multiple books written on what is the one new man. With everything that I have shared with you and taught you thus far this evening, the one new man is going to make all the sense in the world. But I'm not just going to theoretically put it together for you. I want to actually dive in deep to the to the actual scriptures in Ephesians chapter 2 so that we can discover what the one new man is all about. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 and follows says this, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, meaning that you could not be a part of the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise that are part of Israel, having no hope and without God in the world. Right now, before we go on the, on the next slide, I want to point out something. The emphasis of the writer of Ephesians in chapter 2 is telling us that you are Gentiles, 
you've not been able to be part of Israel. You can't be a part of her covenants of promise. You can't be part of the commonwealth up until now. Do you see that? That's his point. You could never be part of Israel until now. And he's talking about the Gentiles. That's really important. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who is made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. What's the middle wall of separation? The southern kingdom of Judah, because of the divorce of the northern kingdom, created a hostility wall of separation between the Jew and the house of Israel Gentiles that that were living among the Gentiles saying that you can never be part of the commonwealth of Israel because you guys were divorced. You guys were Gomer. You're Gomer's children. You're not allowed to be a part of our club. So there was a enmity, a wall of hatred between the two. And what Yeshua did was He came and literally destroyed it. Having abolished in His flesh the hatred. Remember that. He abolished the hatred that was contained. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create Himself one new man from the two making peace and that He might reconcile both kingdoms to God in one body through the cross thereby putting to death the hatred. No more hatred. Going back to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, we see this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. A colt, the foal of a donkey, exactly the way Yeshua came in the first century. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem because they're fighting each other. The horse from, from Ephraim or the, from Jerusalem, and the chariot from Ephraim. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to those nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. There'll be no more fighting. That's the prophecy that Ephesians 2 is talking about. So when you get to verse 17, it says this, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. Now, you will probably not find an English version of your Bible that has these words in all caps, which tell you that it's a direct quote from the Old Testament. Because if you go back and you actually take this quote back to where Paul is referring it from and quoting it from, what you find is it comes right from Isaiah chapter 57, 18 and 19, when it says, I have seen his ways and I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore the comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace, to him that is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. If you read it in context, it's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel is far off. He says, I've sent him far off into the nations. Judah is near because she came back from Babylon and she started keeping the commandments. So God says, they're near to me. Old Testament Israel, Judah's near, Ephraim is off in la-la land, wandering around. So now if you go back to the book of Ephesians, it makes a lot more sense. When you come to verse 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you Gentiles, you northern house of Israel, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. What's he saying? He's saying that you Gentiles, and look, I want to make this very clear. I'm not saying that the word Gentiles means house of Israel. I'm saying that the house of Israel was comprised of Gentiles. They became Gentiles. There's no doubt there was a mixed multitude. Remember when Israel came out of Egypt, what happened? There was a mixed multitude. It was the northern house of Israel. It was the southern house of Israel. At that time, it was all 12, but eventually it would become both. So you have the house of Israel, the house of Judah, but then there was also the mixed multitude that came out from Egypt, the smart Egyptians. 
that said, you know what? After 10 plagues, I'm following that God. <laughs> Moses goes to Yahweh and says, you know, hey, God, it's Mo. What do I do? All these mixed multitude, these Egyptians are coming up with us. What should we do? Should we send them back? What do we do? And God says, no. If they'll circumcise themselves and they'll make themselves part of Israel and follow my covenant, there'll be no difference. They'll be in, like a native born. They'll be grafted in. So some characteristics of Ephraim. They're from the northern ten tribes. They were dispersed into all the nations after their captivity. They live amongst the, the Gentiles. And they have forgotten the name of their God. Jeremiah 23, 27 says that the northern house of Israel will actually forget the name of their God. It also says they are a wealthy people. Genesis 49, 22. They do not know or understand the law of God, and they do not keep it. I wanted to put this scripture out there just so you know it. Hosea 8, 10. So you believe me. Yes, though they have hired among the nations, now I will gather them, and they shall sorrow a little because of their burden of the king of princes. I have written for them the great things of my Torah, which is what the law is in Hebrew, but they were considered a strange thing. So in other words, I wrote the law, but because they assimilated into the nations and the Gentile, they don't even know what it is. It's confusing to them. It's strange to them. More characteristics of Ephraim. They're called not my people, sons of the living God, Hosea 2.23, those that are far off and lost sheep. Characteristics of Judah, they have the law of God. They're called those that are near. They did not lose their identity because they came back after their captivity, and they are the Jewish people of today. So who did the Messiah come for, really? Strap in. Here we go. Matthew chapter 15, verse 24 says this, and he answered and said, I was, sent, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is your Messiah. This is Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, making this statement. Do you think that He is just throwing words into the air? I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Or do you think that the one who wrote about the lost sheep of the house of Israel knows exactly what He's saying when He says, I came only for the ones that were scattered. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, John 3.16, Jim, every baseball game. <laughs> they hold up the little sign behind home plate, John 3.16, for God so loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believed upon Him will have eternal life, right? John 3.16, the whole world. But who were the captains that were supposed to be sent into the world? but the 12 disciples, but the 12 tribes. They were sent to the rest, rest of the nations. They didn't do their job. They dropped the ball. They took God's law. They took God's commandment, which God says is a light to the nations. David, King David, a man of God's own heart, says in, in chapter 119, he says that it is God's commandments that are a light to his path. They kept the light to themselves. And then they got rid of the light and, and took somebody else's light from another nation. They started serving other gods. So he, he got rid of the northern house of Israel, scattered them throughout the all four corners of the earth. And he says, I'm going to bring them back. Remember all those scriptures that you thought I was just beating into the ground when he said, I'm going to scatter them and then I'm going to bring them back. How do you think he's going to bring them back? This is the guy that was sent to go get them. Watch how he does it. John 10, 16. And other sheep, this is incredible, I have, which are not of this fold. Which fold? Judah. He's talking to the Jewish people, the house of Judah. I have other sheep which are not of this fold, this kingdom. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and they will be one flock and one shepherd. John eleven fifty one 51 says, now this, Caiaphas, probably one of the most incredible prophecies in the New Testament that you will never hear about, most likely. 
Caiaphas, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did not say this on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, the Jewish Israel of the first century, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. Even Caiaphas, the high priest, prophesied that Yeshua is not just going to die for the Jewish people. He's going to die for the children of God scattered abroad, which we now know from 110 verses are the house of Israel, the lost sheep. Are you ready for the greatest love story of all time? Here we go. The north was divorced. We've already established that. Jeremiah 3.8, just to put an exclamation point on it. And I saw that for all the adulterous, adulteries of faithless Israel, I sent her away and gave her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear. But she went along and was a harlot also. But she did not get divorced. The house of Israel gets divorced because she whored among the nations. Then it goes on to say in Jeremiah 3, 1, they say, if a man divorces a wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. Folks, this is a huge problem, big problem. This is why this is the mystery, because God himself is saying all throughout the prophets, in the Torah, that I'm, I'm going to get rid of the northern house of Israel, I'm going to scatter you out to all four corners of the earth, but when you hear my voice and you come back to me, anybody that knows the Torah knows that can't happen. Once you divorce, once God divorces his bride, she can't come back. That's why it says in Jeremiah 3, 1, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, which is what Israel was doing, may he return her, to her again? Can she come back? Would not her land be polluted? She's defiled. But he says, but you've played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. Big problem because Deuteronomy chapter 24 gives us the Torah commandment against this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some indecency in her, talking about fornication, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts, her in, and, and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her back again since she's been defiled, for that's an abomination before the Lord. So guys, picture yourself. You're Jewish in the first century. You're Paul. You studied under Gamaliel. You have this scripture memorized. So when you come across all of the, the scriptures and the prophets where God says, I'm divorcing the northern house of Israel, there's no way for her to come back. It's not possible. It's done. Out the door, over the shoulder. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. This is why in the first century... The northern house of Israel, which Josephus says is by the multitudes across the Euphrates River, why you don't hear about them? Why they're not allowed to be part of Israel? Because the Judah, the Judites, or the short form, the Jews, which comprise of, of modern day Israel in the first century, won't let them because they know the Torah. You can't be Israel. You lost your identity. You guys blew it. We blew it. We went to Babylon. We paid our penalty, but we came back. You guys assimilated into the nations, and you never came back, and God divorced you for it. You can't come back. It doesn't matter how bad you want to come back. And by the way, eh, we'll let you come back, but you've got to convert to the southern kingdom. How many of you think did that? No way. 
Why? Because it was Hatfields and McCoys. When you had the northern and southern kingdom that were in existence back in the, you know, after Solomon, they were always fighting one another. No way was an was a Israelite from the northern kingdom going to convert to Judah. Not going to happen. They had their own tribal identity. Very few did this. More of them were pagan Gentiles that were not Israelites that actually converted to Judaism than, and than ever an Israelite from the northern kingdom. So we have a major problem. Because this becomes the mystery that Paul talks about. There's several mysteries, but the large mystery is how does God solve this? Because He invites them to come back, which is, seems to be against His own law. So you come to Romans chapter 7. One of the most incredible chapters of the entire Bible. Guys, this is the chapter that says, and the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things that I, I want to do, I don't do, and the things I do and I do and I don't do, and all those things. This is that chapter. It starts off in a bizarre way. Listen to how it starts off. Romans chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says this, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law. Stop. You cannot read the rest of this chapter unless you know the law of God. Why do you think he's saying that? Because he's saying what I'm about to say is only found in the Torah. And if you don't understand the Torah, what I'm about to say is going to be completely confusing and you're going to read right into it. You're Baptist, you're Lutheran, you're charismatic, Christian, Catholic, whatever you want to call yourself, all 41,000 of you, you will read into this scripture what is not there. So I'm going to help you out and tell you, read the Torah first before you read Romans 7. Because he says the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Why? Because the law was given to man. So if you die, you're not subject to the penalty that the laws give. For the woman who has a husband, we just read the scripture, is bound by the law to her husband as long as the husband lives. But if the husband dies, she's released of the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, where do you think he's getting this from? Deuteronomy chapter 24, that's why it says you better know the law. She'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. She can't be an adulteress if she's not married. If, she is, if her husband dies, she's free to marry another man. But if her husband's still alive, she's an adulteress. By the way, side note, the only way she cannot be an adulteress is if she gets a certificate of divorce. A lot of confusion in the Messianic community about that. If you get a certificate of divorce and you marry someone else, you're not in adultery. Back then there were two forms of, of divorce, if you will. The certificate of divorce, which is formal, which means you could marry someone else, or if you're put away. If they put you away without a certificate of divorce, then you are actually still married and you are committing adultery, which is why the next husband, most of them would not marry someone unless they could show them legally that you've been divorced because they didn't want to walk into adultery either. So back to our, our scripture here. Therefore, brethren, verse 4, you have also become dead to the law through the body of Christ. What law are we talking about? The law of adultery. He's giving us Deuteronomy chapter 24. He's showing us the prophecy right here. You're married. You went and whored among the nations. You can't come back. He says that, therefore, my brethren, you are also dead to the law through the body of Christ. The alive body or dead body? The dead body of Christ. That you may be married to another, to him who's raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put it all together. Who is Israel's bridegroom? Yahweh. God was Israel's bridegroom. Why did he divorce her? Adultery. According to Deuteronomy 24, could an adulteress come back to her first husband? No. What is called, what's it called if you cheat on your husband? Adultery. 
according to Romans 7, what is the only way that a woman can be freed from the law of adultery? The death of her first husband. The only way is for her husband to die. Guys, the bridegroom died for his bride. This is the good news. This is the mystery that Paul has been trying to solve. This is what the patriarchs are trying to solve. This is what the angels are, were trying to solve. When they're standing up in the heavens, I would imagine, and God said, I'm divorcing you, but you're going to come back. And they look to each other and say, who wants to tell him that they can't do that? No one says anything for thousands of years, but God already knew how he was going to solve this. If you ever wondered why the lamb had to come and die, this is it. It's to free the bride from adultery. Now the next question is this. Why did he have to raise from the dead? Because there's no sacrifice in the, all of the law of God that requires the animal to come back together and rise for the propitiation of sins. Because the propitiation of sins is found in the blood, not in the breath. So the moment that, God, that Jesus died was the moment that we, for, we are forgiven according to the law of God. Why did he have to raise from the dead? He rises from the dead because he's creating an eligible bachelor for his bride to marry. That is why he rises from the dead. He says, here, here, pick me. Choose me. Don't go amongst the nations anymore. I've broken the curse. The curse for the northern house of Israel is they could never come back. And the Jew knew that. So when Paul goes to the elect, to the ones scattered in Galatia, in Ephesians, and all across that, that known world of the Mediterranean, and he walks into the cities, where do you think he's going to go? First he goes to the Jew in the synagogue, and then he goes out to the Gentiles. He goes out to the northern house of Israel into their streets and says, gather around all of you Danites, Naphtalites, all you Gentiles that have lost your identity and don't even care. I got some good news for you. You can come back. And here's why. Because the God of the universe who divorced your brethren, your forefathers, for their sin, and you know as well as I do, you can't come back, but He sent His only begotten Son that bridegroom died, rose from the dead, broke that curse, and you are free to move about the cabin. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is what the marriage supper of the Lamb is all about. This is why the marriage supper of the Lamb exists. This is why it's called a marriage supper. And not a end of the time supper. It's not a millennium supper. It's a marriage supper. Who do you think he's marrying? He's marrying his bride, and his bride has always been called Israel. The new covenant starts right here. Jeremiah chapter 31. This is all going to make sense. Behold, I'll bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. Talking about the house of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him. And keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Theologian, listen carefully. This is the chapter that we've all been told is the new covenant chapter. We're going to get to it. But we're starting early in the chapter to establish that who is he talking about bringing into the new covenant? Those who are scattered. Further down in verse 18, I've surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. You've chastened me. You've chastised me. And I was chastised like an untrained bull. Restore me and I will return for you are the Lord my God. 
Jeremiah 31, 20, is Elohim my, my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. There we go. Mercy again. Compassion. Back to the story of Hosea. With whom is the new covenant made? Jeremiah 31, verse 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. You'll notice there is no house of Gentiles. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant in which they broke. See, there was nothing wrong with the covenant. It was something wrong with them. Though I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my Torah, that's what it says in Hebrew, in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And just so you know, at, at Mount Sinai is when he first said this. And he says, now I'm giving you all my commandments. I've given you my laws, my decrees, my ordinances. Now I want you to write it on your heart. You're a bride. I want you to do it from your heart. I don't want you to make it obligatory. I want you to make it a bunch of laws and commandments. When I tell you to love your neighbor, it's not out of obligation. I want you to be, I want it to come from your heart. Ladies, what what wife out there does not want her husband to love her from the heart? They can tell when we're doing it just to check it off our list. And they can tell when it comes from our heart. God wants it to come from our heart. So he says, no more is the house of Israel going to fall fall away from me and fall away from my commandments because I'm going to write it on their heart. They're going to want to do this. And I'm going to send a helper called my spirit. So then we go to Romans for the connective verse. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law because it was strange to them, by nature do the things in the law, These, although not having the Torah, because you guys won't let them be a part of your club, they're a law to themselves, who show the work of the Torah written on their hearts. He's connecting this to Jeremiah 31. If you haven't figured it out now, by now, ladies and gentlemen, as a follower of Jesus, you're part of Israel. You are part of Israel. You're not separate from Israel. It is not Israel and the Gentiles and the new covenant with the house of Israel, house of Judah, and the new covenants with the Gentiles. Our own theology doesn't work. It says that the new covenant is only with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. You've been grafted into the commonwealth of Israel and have been made partakers in the covenants of promise. So this begs the question, am I saying that the 12 tribes of Israel, the descendants of Israel, are the only ones that can be saved? That is not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying that the only people that can be saved are the ones that are the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm not even talking about a bloodline. The bloodline doesn't exist. This is spiritual. Salvation has never been by bloodline. How many times in the, as the patriarchs got skipped over, the firstborn gets skipped over to go to the secondborn, proving that God is not concerned about the bloodline only. There's something greater. Romans 10, 12 says this, for there's no distinction between Jew and, G- and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In God's eyes, there is absolutely no difference between Jew and Gentile when it comes to salvation. The Gentiles join his people Israel. Watch this. 1249 of Exodus says, One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourns among you. Isaiah 56, 3. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Also, the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him, and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling my Sabbath and holds fast to my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Do you see that? He's talking about an end times. If the, even if the nations 
want to come and be a part of me, they can. As long as they keep my Sabbath, hold fast to my covenant, and they call me the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they follow after me, do what I say, even them, I will make them my people, and I will bring them into my house of prayer. Zechariah 2 says this, Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people. I will dwell in your midst. And you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. This is a messianic uh, uh, scripture going into the millennium. Watch this, in the millennium. 47, 22 of Ezekiel says, It shall be that you will divide it by a lot as an inheritance for yourselves, and for the strangers, talking about the land, you're going to divide up the land, who will dwell among you, and who bear children among you. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall be in that day that whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. Do you see this? In the millennium. Even the Gentiles, even those that are not part of Israel at all, when they come back to God, He grafts them into Israel and tells everybody that knows who they are. Because remember in Revelation, there's 12,000 from every tribe. So at some point, we don't know how, but at least 144,000 know which tribe they're from. And to make sure that they don't get arrogant, he says, all those that come back to my covenant that don't know which tribe they're from, they get to choose whatever tribe they want to be a part of, and you have to accept them, and that's going to be their inheritance. I'm claiming Gaza Strip right now. Because if you know Gaza, it's on the beach. Okay. I'm sure it'll get rebuilt a little differently. Look at this. Immigration. I want to give you an example. When someone comes to the United States, let's say from China or from Australia, they're no longer Chinese. They're an American. This is what makes this nation of the United States of America so incredible, is that we are made up of every nation. You're not still Chinese just because you came from China. You're a Chinese American. You're an Australian American. You're a German American. You see a common denominator here. So when someone comes into Israel and follows the God of Israel, they're no longer a Gentile. They're a Gentile Israelite. They're Gentile Hebrew. They're part of the commonwealth of Israel. And by default, they are part of that inheritance. No one can keep or separate us from the, law, uh, from the love of God. And His love is found in His inheritance. There's a myth that says that God's law is only for the Jews. Did you know if God's law, listen Christian, if God's law is only for the Jews, then there is no inheritance for us. Because the inheritance is directly connected to the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and in Jacob. So many will say the Gentiles should not keep the covenant laws of Israel. They only have to keep the Noahide laws. We've all grown up with this. We've all lived this, learned this. Let's test it for a moment. Numbers 15, 15, for the assembly there shall be one statute for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you, a statute forever throughout your generations. You and the sojourner shall be alike before the Lord. One law and one rule shall be for you, native-born Israelite, and for you, you stranger that sojourns with you. So let's dive into the word stranger, because from an academic perspective, this is where they're going to fall on. We better define what stranger is. That Hebrew word is ger. In the Greek, it's proselytos. So we're going to do a little homework because there is a, there is a, a, a contention that the sojourner is not a Gentile, but one who is converting to Judaism. So let's, let's figure that out. Some say strangers were those that were converting to Judaism. Let's actually put that argument to a test. The proselytos argument. 
The Greek Septuagint, now I know this is the theological part, but this, this message is going out to a lot of people, and this has got to be proved. So let's talk about this for a second. The Greek Septuagint, all right, so the, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament gives us insight into how the apostolic community would have understood and interpreted the passage. By the way, this is coming from First Fruits of Zion, One Law, and the Messianic Gentiles. So the Jewish Messianic community, by and large, believes that the uh, the ger or the sojourner is not a Gentile that is a part of Israel, but someone who's converting to Judaism, even though Judaism didn't exist uh, when that scripture was given. Under the influence of the LXX, which is the Septuagint, they would have interpreted Numbers 15, 15, and 16 to read as follows. As for the assembly, there shall be one statute for Jews and for the proselyte, a perpetual statute throughout your generations as a Jew... As a Jew is, so shall the proselyte be before the Lord. There is to be one Torah and one ordinance for Jews and for the proselyte who sojourns with you. So what they're saying basically is that the Torah cannot be kept by the Gentile because there's no scripture that telling Gentiles to keep the Torah. And they use this scripture to say that the sojourner, because this is the danger, if ger actually means a real Gentile and not someone that's converting to Judaism, but actually making himself part of Israel and her covenants, then that means the Gentiles are all under the law of God. So they don't want the Gentiles to keep the law of God. You know what? I give them credit, rightfully so. All we do is mess on ourselves everywhere we go. So if we come in and start keeping the Torah by default, we blow it. We'll do it wrong. We'll do it our way. And they won't have control over us. And that's exactly kind of what happened in the first century is a bunch of Gentiles came into the synagogues, messed up the whole thing, and, uh, and, and off to the races we went. So Israelites, let's find out. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 22, verse 21. And it says this exact same word, a proselytos, is used in this context. You shall neither mistreat a proselytos nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So if their definition of stranger is one converting to Judaism, then proselytos has to mean converting to, to, to something. So are they saying that the Israelites were converting to Egypt? Well, this scripture, if interpreted that way, would simply mean that the strangers are, 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 are converting uh, in the land of Egypt. Certainly, they were not converting in the land of Egypt. Here's another one. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger... For you know the heart of a stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Again, I'm giving you just a, 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 a pattern here that the word proselytos cannot possibly mean convert. Otherwise, you have the Israelites converting to Egypt. And, and they were not converting to Egypt. They were living in the land of Egypt. And also, this is even my favorite, Leviticus 25, 23. For you are also proselytos or strangers and sojourners with me. Are they saying that you were, you were converting to God? No. What they're saying is that you were strangers and sojourners with me. You were not of me. You were, you were strangers with me. You didn't know who I was, but you were following along with me. You're strangers. Just The word in English is the best word. From God's perspective, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. The entire point of the New Testament is that there is no Jew or Gentile. There was never supposed to be two kingdoms. It was always the children of God follow God and what He says. And this is the covenant of what He says. If you don't like the Constitution... Try to rewrite it. That's what we've done. Nope. God says, if you don't like the Constitution, you're not part of my kingdom. Because my kingdom is run by my Constitution. It's a bad conversion formula. 1 Corinthians 7.18 Was anyone called while he was circumcised? Let him not be uncircumcised. Was anyone called while he was uncircumcised? This is a very misunderstood scripture. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. This is, a, this is an oxymoron. This can't happen. He's saying that the only thing that matters is keeping God's commandments, yet circumcision is one of the commandments. And he says it's, it's nothing. 
Or is he not actually talking about physical circumcision? It's an idiom. Paul's not talking about physical circumcision. They were talking about physical circumcision. What he was talking about is Judaism, because Judaism was called the circumcision. Acts 10.45, And those of the circumcision of the Jews who believed were astonished, as many as come with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out among the Gentiles also. There was called the circumcision party. And the circumcision party had a seven-step process to convert to Judaism with circumcision being the very first step. You could not be saved in first century Judaism unless you were circumcised. And Paul and the disciples were arguing this fact that no, the first step is not circumcision. The first step is faith. Circumcision means nothing without faith. So if you want to compel my converts to get circumcised, then then it means nothing because you're telling them to do something for their salvation rather than to have faith. Works comes later. Circumcision is a general term referring to a segment of Judaism. So when you go back to 1 Corinthians 7, 18, this is what it really is saying. Was anyone called whilst Jewish? Let him not be a Gentile. Was anyone called while Gentile? Let him not become Jewish. Being Jewish is nothing and being a Gentile is nothing. What matters is if we keep the commandments of God. Does that make more sense? So there's a certain first century Jewish sect believed Gentiles must convert to Judaism via their rabbinic formula, which included getting circumcised their way as a prerequisite to joining God's people. This is why Paul says, I wish they'd just emasculate themselves in the book of Galatians. Because all they talk about is is circumcision, not understanding that the first circumcision that God talks about, he says, is of the heart. Paul opposes the theology and taught that Gentiles become part of God's people by grace, faith first, through faith in Yeshua, which is then made evident by keeping God's commandments. That's why James says what? Don't look into the perfect law of liberty and then walk away and forget what it looks like. Don't be a hearer of the, be a doer of the word. What's the only word in the first century? There is no New Testament. That's why it says the perfect law of liberty. The law of liberty is the Torah without the traditions and doctrines of man. That's the definition to the first century disciple. It wasn't, no, it wasn't a new law. Listen, if God's commandments are only for people that are converting to Judaism and only for the Jewish people, is John contradicting Paul who says you don't have to convert to Judaism when he says this? In 1 John 5, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. If the law of God was only for the Jewish people, as we've all been taught, then there's no way for us to love God. Because the disciple is telling us this is the definition of loving God is doing what He says. And what do you think the commandments were? There's no other commandments of God. Let's talk about being led by the Spirit versus being led by the flesh. Romans 8, verse 5, we're almost finished, I promise. For those who live according to the flesh, who wants to live according to the flesh? Oh, come on. You guys are not very good telling the truth. (laughs) Spiritual people in here. For those according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh. So listen, we're going to let Bible define what Bible says. Let's find out what flesh is and living by the Spirit is. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is in hatred towards God. It's an enmity against God. For look, look, listen. It is not subject to the law of God. Do you realize what that just said? No, you don't. Let me say it again. The spiritually minded is life and peace. To the carnally minded, it's death. 
Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it cannot be subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. What this is saying, my friends, is that the carnal mind does not subject itself to the law of God. The spiritual-minded person does. There's no way to get around this. It says this, and only this. There's only one interpretation. Being spiritually minded is following the law of God. Now, I know this brings up a huge can of worms of, of what does this look like. I'm not going into that can right now. I have tons of material that do. I'm just showing what we've been missing as covenant Israel and partakers of the covenants of promise that the covenants of promise with an S is the law of God that gives us the blessings because it says that if you keep my commandments you're blessed led by the spirit versus led by the flesh walking in the spirit is subjecting yourself to the laws of God walking in the flesh and being carnally minded is not submitting to the laws of God this is why Jesus said in Matthew, he says, not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law of God until all of the heavens and the earth are disappeared, are removed. Well, the last time that I checked, the heaven and the earth is still here. And it says that if anyone teaches against the law of God, you'll be least in the kingdom of heaven. That's what it says. And it says the whole world is under the law of God. And I know our Jewish brethren say that the law of God is only for themselves. They do not want us keeping it. Their agenda is pure, I understand. Because when we keep it, we blow it. But the whole world is under the law of God, according to Romans 3. It says, now we know that what things soever the law says, it speaks to them that are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be brought under the judgment of God because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For through the law comes only the knowledge of sin. What's he saying here? The whole world is guilty before God. Why? Because they transgressed. They're under the law of God. They're under the law. They're under the penalty of the law. How can you be under the penalty of something that you're not even subjected to? How can I get in trouble for breaking a law that's not for me? If the law of God is not for everybody, then how is the whole world guilty? What are they guilty of? Breaking what? This is our problem. If you do away with the law of God, there's no definition of sin. If there's, if no, there's no definition of sin, there's no curse. If there's no curse, then what do you need a Savior for? And why are we spending a billion dollars a year telling people in Africa about Jesus and telling them that they're in sin when the very definition of sin is transgressing the law of God? And here it is right here in the print. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of God's law. The northern house of Israel transgressed the law of God. And Romans says what? The wages of breaking my law is what? Death. And in that case, it was a certificate of death. No longer to come back. You're dead, according to me. The law doesn't have to go over after someone who's dead. Because they're already dead. Isn't that what Jesus says? He says, don't worry about the world. They're already condemned. What do you think they're condemned by? The very law that they broke condemns them. The DNA of the remnant. I love this. In Revelation it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Revelation, the very definition of the saints of God are those that... that that are following Jesus Christ and that testimony, but they also keep the commandments. They don't have a religion that is weak. They have a religion that's, not, that's not denying the power of God. The power of God is found in His very Word. And the Word of God, according to the Word of God, and David and every prophet, is the law of God. He even says in Mount Sinai, it is my life to you. I'm giving you my life. 
In the millennium, watch this. Isaiah 2, verse 3, many people should come and say, come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, to Jacob. He'll teach us his ways and we shall walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is in the millennium. God is so, it's so impressed to him to teach us because he wants to bless us. There's not a Christian alive today that thinks that if you can break the ninth commandment and commit adultery that you're going to be blessed. You're cursed. Where do you think the idea came from that you're cursed if you commit adultery? Because if you break God's law, you're under a curse. The problem is we only believe in a few. Well, what if God says that he actually meant what he said when he said keep the Sabbath day holy? And it's one of the top ten. A whole other discussion. Zechariah 14, we're almost done. In the day that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year and worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and shall keep the Feast of Tabernacles. We know from Zechariah 14 that you've got to keep all of the feasts, and if you don't, he cuts the rain off. This is in the millennium. So theologian student, don't ask me how. I'm telling you what the Bible says is we've got to do it. It's our inheritance. And I shouldn't even say we got to. That's like looking at your wife and saying, I have to love you. We get to love them. We get to love God. We get to be part of the inheritance. There's so much, my friends, that have been stolen from us. Just look at the feast days of long. All of them are about Yeshua. They're divided into two. The spring feast days and the fall feast days. He died on Passover, was put into the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread when they're getting all of sin out of their house. The Holy Spirit breathes life into Jesus. He raises from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. Coincidence? The Holy Spirit comes down on the Feast of Shavuot in Greek Pentecost, fulfilling the first coming of Yeshua. But the second coming of Yeshua is connected to the last four, the last three feast days. The Feast of Trumpets, it's it's not a coincidence that it says that at the sound of a trumpet, the dead in Christ will come first. It's not just a, a stroke of genius, it's a stroke of truth, because he's coming for the coronation of the king at the Feast of Trumpets. And then there is the Feast of Atonement, which is what? Judgment Day, Yom Kippur, National Day of Atonement. And last but not least, the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. All of those happen in the fall. All of those happen in the second coming of the Messiah. We've been stripped of our inheritance, stripped of the curriculum, and we're trading the very curriculum and calendar of God and the holy days of God for holidays of man. And we fight to hold on to the man-made tradition. And Mark 7 is coming true again when Jesus said, and you do many things like this. Trading the traditions and doctrines of men, or the commandments of God for the traditions and doctrines of men. So, in closing, is it really all about Israel, the chosen people? Look at this. Twelve tribes with one king. Twelve disciples with one king. Twelve baskets left over full of bread. Not coincidence, my friend. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 28, Assuredly, I say to you that in the restoration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you will have followed Me also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In the millennium, the twelve tribes of Israel are what's being judged. We've just started. Yeshua heals a girl that's twelve. He starts teaching in the temple at what age? Twelve. Coincidence, right? He says that that there are 12 hours during the day, 12 months in a year. In Revelation, there's 12,000 from each tribe that are sealed. 12 angels, 24 elders, two from each tribe. 12 gates with 12 pearls each. 12 constellations in the heaven that tell the gospel story from A to Z. A tree of life in Revelation that produces 12 fruits for each of the 12 months for the 12 tribes that come through the 12 gates. The story of the 12 spies. How many came back with a positive report? How many came back with a negative report? Do you think that was coincidence? Ten tribes had a negative report and were divorced. They could not cross the Jordan River. Hello? 
Only the two tribes in the south were considered near. Ten commandments written on two tablets of stone. The two witnesses in Revelation, guess what? One is from the northern kingdom and one is from the southern kingdom. It's everywhere, my friends. Look at the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, two sons under one roof with one father and one son goes astray into the, into the land, into the Gentiles. To degree, I even think it's funny, that he's eating and sleeping with the pigs. He becomes as unkosher as you can possibly get. And what happens? In the depth of his despair and his unkosherness and his uncleanness, he realizes who he really is. I will go back to my father, and I am the son of my father. And if I go back and just be a servant in his kingdom, maybe he would accept me. And the Father, see the humility of the house of Israel, I'm not worthy. You see the mistake that some people make when they understand this concept is they're arrogant. And they go back to Judah and they they say, I have an inheritance, this is who I am. No, that is not how we're supposed to act. We're supposed to come back as the humble servant and say, maybe God would just take us as servants in His kingdom. And Yahweh says, no, 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 no. I'm going to kill the fatted calf. I'm going to kill the lamb. You never killed a lamb for me. So the lamb gets killed for who? The house of Israel. Do you think it's coincidence that there was only ten lepers that were healed on the road? There's ten that get healed. Why was there 10? Because the northern house of Israel were lepers. And if you know about Torah, if you know what the law of the lepers are, they're put out of Israel. Yeshua is going for the 10 lepers prophetically saying, I'm coming except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel to bring them home. It's everywhere. The two sticks of Ezekiel 37. The one new man of Ephesians 2. And the best example is this. is a husband and a wife. Can can you come on up here with your wife, please? I want to show you the most incredible prophecy of the Bible, the very first one, I believe, the prophetic picture that God gives us, is in the garden, you have Adam and Eve. Could you stand behind your husband, please? This is how Adam was created in the garden. It was Adam and Eve together. Matter of fact, a better way to say this, because I do a lot of marriage counseling. She's got your back. Because Eve is looking the other direction. This is how Adam was created. Adam is Israel. He's the child of God. He is the first seed of God. It's all 12 tribes are inside of Adam. The two kingdoms are one. And then what happens is a wife or a woman separated when Adam and Eve sinned. They were pulled apart, if you will. Eve was taken from the side of Adam prophetically saying that at some point in the future, the two kingdoms are going to be separate. But if they will join hands under their Maker, the two shall become one flesh. A husband and a wife underneath the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is actually a beautiful prophetic picture of Israel and all the prophecies about her. This is why they fight so much too. (laughs) But this is why they love each other so much. It's because they understand that although we may be different, 
Although I may be different from my Jewish brethren of the southern kingdom. Although you may be different as a husband and a wife, you're still one. You're still family. And your love comes from that which is above. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's one God. Stand with me, please. His name is Yahweh. There's one covenant that gets renewed at the end of time, no doubt about it. There's one law, one Messiah, Yeshua. And there's only one people. And that people's name is Israel. Israel is the people of God. You are the people of God. This doesn't take anything away from our Messianic Jewish brethren. They are the people of God. It doesn't take anything away from the Jewish people that do not believe in Yeshua. They have the covenants under Abraham. Irrevocable. Can't take them away. But eternal life and the eternal kingdom is given to those who follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the one he prophesied would come and talk and bring salvation to the Gentiles. That would be Yeshua Himself. And through the salvation to the Gentiles comes salvation to the rest of the world. That's what He says. To the Jew first, Yeshua came. Then He sent out to the northern kingdom of Israel. Doesn't it make sense? He's got to unite the clans first in order for the rest of the world to be saved. That's what the disciples were doing. They would naturally go to those who had a framework of the Scriptures first. Then they would go out to the uttermost parts of the earth. First start with your warm blood. The cousins from the north. And they did that. I suggest to you, my friends, that the day has finally come when we will learn our identity, that we have learned our identity and it will change our purpose. It will change our mission. I know this is going to mess with a lot of people's theology. God is, that's what God does. He messes with man-made theology to get us back to the garden, to get us back to the truth because the truth can only do one, one thing and that's what? Set us free. I encourage you to go back and watch this again dissect it, look at it, see if it is not the truth, if it does not resonate in your heart, that there's a reason why you love Israel. It's because it's part of who you are. It's not just because you love the Jewish people. You love them for a reason. You're the only people on earth that love the Jewish people. And there's a reason. It's because they're your brother. And until we understand who we are, we will never be able to stand by them the way that God intended for us to do so. Let's pray. Father God, I come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, who shed his blood, Father, so that we could come back into covenant, so that we could come back into inheritance. I pray that you would lift the blindness from Benjamin, and that Joseph and Benjamin will embrace so that the rest of the family can be healed. Father, I pray that you would take this message, God, around the world. Challenge everyone, God, to come back. To come back into the covenants of promise through your Son. Father, forgive us for our blindness. Forgiveness for being deaf, not wanting to listen, for considering your law a strange thing. You sent your son to fish them out, and in the last days, you will call out the hunters. Let now be the time that we return and repent and begin to do Bible things in Bible ways, putting aside the foolishness of our youth, of the traditions and doctrines of men. May it be known this day that your shofar has hit your lips and your frequency and sound is reverberating around the earth, calling out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Father, 
I ask you to not make this word void, but I pray that you would use it to call your people from wherever they may be found, in every tribe, in every tongue. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.